I'm Leah Lane, an award-winning travel writer and author of Places I Remember, Tales, Truths, Delights from 100 Countries. On this podcast, we share conversations with travelers about fascinating destinations and memorable experiences around the world. Sometimes I think the travel world can be divided into those willing to float on anything and those reluctant to get on the water wary of crowded ports and the potential problems of close quarters. Or maybe you're in between, ready for an out-of-the-ordinary adventure on an ocean or river. Our guest is Bob Levenstein, CEO and co-founder of CruiseCompete.com, a free service that allows travelers to select a cruise, then compare multiple custom cruise offers from competing travel agencies. Cruise Compete member agents have provided more than 17.5 million quotes to cruise travelers. Welcome, Bob, or should I say welcome aboard? Welcome aboard works. Okay. I've also been on many cruises in my over 50 years of international travel. In fact, I wrote a book in the 1990s called The World's Most Exciting Cruises. Later in this episode, we'll be talking about some of our memorable cruises. But let's start with questions people are most interested in now. The situation is always changing, but what's going on concerning safety and health? Uh, Well, the, the news is mostly good on the cruise front. The uh, ships are starting to sail again. There are a lot of different safety measures in place, but I would say there are three that are most important. Number one is the ships are now, the lines are now testing passengers before they get on board to make sure at the start of the cruise, no one's getting on board with COVID. The second thing that they are doing is requiring a lot of vaccines. It really depends on the ship and the line and it's changing frequently. But overall, I think what what you'll find is just about all the adults on every cruise ship are vaccinated. All of the crews are absolutely vaccinated. And it's normally just the kids under 12 who aren't, aren't yet able to get vaccinations uh, that are unvaccinated. And then the third thing that is, that is probably the most important thing that they are doing is they've upgraded all of the ventilation systems on the ship. I think the more time that goes by as the changing um, understanding of this virus and how it spreads uh, evolves, the thing that really seems to be coming to the fore is this virus sp- spreads in unventilated areas. You need to get enough virus in, uh, in the air in a certain uh, confined space, and you need to breathe it in for a certain amount of time before you get sick. And what the, uh, the ships have really done is upgraded their air, air handling capabilities. So, for example, on Royal Caribbean, the air in your cabin uh, can be changed out as many times as 12 times in an hour. Wow. And in the larger spaces, uh, the air is changed out as many times as 15 times in an hour. So you're talking, you know, every four or five minutes. And they're not just changing it. They're running it through some very high-level filters. And they also have some other um, other stuff that, honestly, I don't quite understand, but is taking the virus, uh, is killing the virus as it goes. So it's, these are the... Um, these are, the, these are the factors that really uh, decide whether something's going to spread on board. There have been a few cases. We had a Royal Caribbean ship that had over 3,000 people come back, and they ended up with six positive COVID tests, mild symptoms. So basically, we're talking about a ship with over 3,000 people together for a week, going to different ports, into different situations, and at the end of the day, one person had the sniff, yeah, and that was it. That's so good. It's, it's really probably safer than, than, uh, than going to your shopping center. Good to know. I know that hygiene has been improved all the way around, of course, and rules are stricter about tours and going off on ports, and there is a doctor aboard. You suggest spending for insurance that airlifts you out just in general when you're on a cruise? I think it really depends on who you are. You know, being a fairly fit person, I, you know, with no comorbidities, no, you know, particular issues. But, you know, if I were in my, when I'm in my 70s, when I'm in my 80s, absolutely, I would do that. It's not terribly expensive. You know, there's a uh, service called Air Ambulance, which I think is, uh, I've heard good things about. And it's, you know, it's, it's smart to look at all your options and read carefully what insurance covers and make a decision for yourself. Yes. Now let's talk about some of the reasons why cruising is a great way to travel. For one, you see places you otherwise wouldn't. You are able to go all over the world. uh, And I know that's one of the reasons I love cruising. The convenience of just unpacking once, of course, is well known. And then there's the lodging, food, and entertainment you can count on wherever in the world you are. What are some of the others? 
Well, um, I think all of those are, are very, very good points. Uh, but there are, there are just a lot of other things that, uh, that make cruising great. Uh, one, just simply the idea you mentioned about people who love to be on the water. I love being on the water. I love the feel of the ocean rocking me asleep. I love sitting out on the balcony of the cruise ship at night. And just, you know, hearing the water go past, uh, just there, there's just there's a real, you know, romance of the sea, I think, uh, that, that people really enjoy. Another thing that I love about a cruise that maybe doesn't people don't think about as much is the people who are the other passengers. I was once in one of my first cruises I took was out of uh, San Juan. And this was many, many years ago. I'd never been to Puerto Rico. And we figured, hey, you know, as long as we're here after the cruise, we'll spend, uh, you know, we'll spend four nights on this tropical island. Well, you know, after having lots of entertainment and fun and people to hang out with, first night we said, oh, okay, let's, uh, let's go out and have dinner. Well, let's get some typical local food. So we asked the concierge at the, at the hotel, and then we had to figure out how to get our rental car to that restaurant. And we got to that restaurant and there was an hour wait. So we ended up, you know, going somewhere else. Then we thought, well, you know, okay, let's go hear some live music. It was a Tuesday night. There's not a live, lot of live music in a city on a Tuesday night. Whereas on the cruise ship, we had a choice of four or five venues. It's, there's just lots and lots of convenience. There are lots of things that are already planned, that are already set up for you. You don't have to think. Um, it actually reminds me of a, a travel service called Backroads that uh, does these active tours. And it's fairly expensive, but, you know, you go, you do a camping trip kind of thing, or you do an in trip and you stay in lodges. But one of the things, you know, that, that really struck me on one of the camping trips was just the amount of logistics that they handle for you that you don't have to think about. Yes, it's more expensive than going on your own. But on the other hand, you get to do three or four times as much stuff because you're not worrying about the meals and the cooking and how do I get stuff from one place to another. And cruising is like that. Everything is laid out for you. You get there, as you said, you get everything unpacked, you get organized, and you know, here's another thing that, that, that I realize about travel is I'm always stressed until things are organized and put in place, and I know where they are. There, there's so much stuff at home that you just take for granted of, you know, I know where my clothes are, I know that I have, you know, that I have what I need, or I know that they're washed, or I know where to get my coffee, just all of these things. Once you have that, once you have that peace of mind where you know where stuff is, and you don't have to think about it, and it becomes automatic, you relax more. And with cruising, you get that. As you say, you pack everything away, it's done, you know where it all is, and then you just go off and enjoy. You know right. where the bars are on the ship. You know where you know you can look at a thing and go, oh, well, we want to go hear some live music. Here are five choices. Having the option of the short trips, the, the tours that are available. We do, in fact, at Cruise Compete, we have a partner that we work with called Shore Excursions Group. And it's great because they don't have to work in as large a volume. Because generally when you go on a tour on a cruise ship, they don't give you that many choices. And so and they're presented to a large number of people. So you tend to have much larger groups that you're going with. That limits some of the things that you can do because it's got to be able to handle a large group. And also, of course, there's a markup you're going to pay. You know, the cruise line's taking 35%. So you save money and you get smaller tours and you get to do what you want. But again, the nice thing is it's okay, we're at this port. We know we're going to meet here. We've already decided what we wanted to do. We've got an expert to take us there and make sure that we spend the maximum amount of time enjoying and not trying to figure out where we're going. You know, what's the best way to do this? It's all already there. Right. I would say that, you know, many people go walk off the ship and they select one of the many cabs or the tour companies that are that are on the dock. I would just warn that you want to make sure you can get back to the ship because the ship will leave. And that's one of the risks when you go on your own. It's it's fun. But keep that in mind. Uh, you want to. Yeah, be well, the, uh, the that's what you know, that's something that people are worried about. Really, people missing the ship doesn't happen all that often. And usually when it does, there's a lot of alcohol involved. <laughs> but um, the, for instance, the company that we work with guarantees return to the ship, yes. and you know they'll fly you to the next port if you miss it and all that. I almost missed one. I was <laughs> I was on one in Norway. <laughs> I I almost missed it. I shouldn't. I, the the gangplank was going up, and I jumped on it. So that one, I, wow. I guess I remember forever. Yeah, I was. It was That's in exciting. Norway. It was on a, a mail boat on in Norway. Anyway, I, I should mention also that it's easy to budget with a cruise. It's all inclusive. You know, your meals, entertainment, activities. It's easy to know what you're going to spend. Many cruise ships now add standard spirits and tips. So you have an idea of yeah. what you're spending. 
cruise ships in general, uh, traditionally your alcohol, your uh, shore excursions, and your and the casino are their three biggest onboard revenue generators. Uh, I would add to that uh, there are a lot more a lot more specialty restaurants these days where you can pay a little bit more and and get a, a fancier or a different dining experience. Right. Uh, but uh, no, absolutely, it, the value that you get on a cruise is really unparalleled uh, in terms of you know not being able to not having to worry about the food, the entertainment, and, and all of these other things. And the staff, you get a very nice staff to clean your room and to help you out. It's, it's a lovely feeling. Well, you know, just as it's as having the passengers around, the other passengers are, are great, especially the higher, you're meeting, often meeting people who've been all over the world and love to travel and have great stories and can give you advice on where to go next and how to do things better. It's, they tend to be really interesting people and interesting other experiences in life. You know, that, that part is, is really an underrated part of the experience. You know, another thing about the cruise experience that is really wonderful is, especially on the larger ships, it's not monolithic. It's not one experience. It can be whatever you want it to be. I remember, you know, back in the day again, going on a three-night cruise and, you know, closing down the disco every night at 3 a.m. and partying <laughs> the whole time. And then not too much longer after that, going on a seven-night cruise where I was training for um, triathlon. And we maybe made it to the formal dinner twice on the whole trip. I worked out twice a day. It was, you know, just a much healthier, went to bed earlier. And it can be your choice. You know, for example, you're traveling with, you know, often uh, you get these family groups where you have kids and grandkids. And, you know, the grandparents can go play bridge or go to a lecture or do the things they want to do. The kids clubs are wonderful on these things. It's basically like a summer camp kind of a deal. And I remember taking my son when he was seven. This was a Norwegian cruise. And they mentioned mentioned that the the kids club, you know, closes at 10 o'clock at night. It's like, come on, my kid's seven. He goes to bed at, you know, <laughs> 7, 30, 8 o'clock. He'll never be in there at 10 o'clock. Well, it turned out if we tried to pull him out of that kid's club at 9.55, he complained. He uh -huh. was having such a great time. And I that know. gives the parents, you know, time to do their thing. Go to the pool, go, you know, go hear some music at night, do whatever they want to do. So it's really a nice thing where everybody can get together for meals. They can go to on shore excursions together. But everybody can, can tailor their own experience to what they like and what they want to do. Yes, and I've traveled many times solo on a ship, and it's a wonderful way to meet people. You can be by yourself if you want, chill out, whatever, or you can ask the maitre d' at the restaurant to seat you with interesting people. And I've, I've sat with wonderful people throughout the world and met people who are still friends today. It's a great place to go if you're solo, if you can especially find one ship that uh, is good about the single supplements. I think you have to check that out carefully. Sometimes it's a good deal. Sometimes it isn't, but I think yeah, it's, a, it's... Oddly enough, on a cruise ship, they will charge you more uh, per person if you're the only person in your cabin. And there's actually, it seems odd, but there are actually good reasons from this from, from, a, uh, from a cruise line perspective, which is obviously they're not able to sell that other bed in that cabin if you're already there. But beyond that, they're not making that, that onboard revenue that I mentioned earlier. You know, there's only one person to drink. There's only one person to uh, gamble in the casino or buy short excursions. So they charge more. However, there's been a trend over the last few years of a number of lines having special offers or getting rid of the single supplement. Uh, Norwegian, I think, was the first to start putting out single cabins. Yes, I've stayed in one. They're tiny, yep. but yep. they're yours, and it's wonderful. Yes. And you meet other and singles. how much space do you really need? You yes. don't need much on a ship. Right. And if you look around, there are often offers of reduced or getting re or, or uh, waived single supplements uh, on a number of different ships. It really just depends. Yeah, I think... That's an insider tip. If you can check that before you, you know, sign up, you, there were there were many deals at, at many different times. I think. What are some other tips? I mean, one thing I would say, I think it's personal, but I would splurge for a balcony. I know a lot of people uh, feel an inside cabin is just fine, and I'm sure it is. But I like the idea when I'm especially by myself to be able to go out on the balcony and just enjoy the quiet. Another thing, repositioning cruises. Tell us about that. That's a really good deal if you sure. if you like the sea, especially if you like being on the yes. water. Yes. Well, cruise ships are, are seasonal. And, for example, the Alaska season is going to go from uh, sometime in the middle of May to sometime in September, and then it gets too cold. 
uh, ditto with uh, with the big ships in Europe. A lot of them only sail pretty much in the summer months. So where do they go? Well, they all go to the Caribbean for the winter. And to get the ship from the when they take the ship from you know from Europe to the Caribbean or from Alaska around to the Caribbean, maybe they're going through the Panama Canal. Uh, you often have these uh, sh- these itineraries that are not port heavy. You may have two or three sea days in a row, and you're going to have to have two one way flights generally, because you've got to get to the start and you got to get home from where it ends, rather than it you know, being in the same place and you can buy a round trip. Uh, and because of that, those are off, often less expensive. Uh, the other reason uh, why they tend to be cheaper is they're sailing at times of the year that are less popular. Uh, and that's really the uh, probably my first tip on getting a good deal on a cruise, is you want to cruise when other people aren't. And generally, the general rule on that one is simply, if kids are in school, the cruise will be less expensive. Mm-hmm. If kids are out of school, the cruise will be more expensive. You know, people wonder why, oh, well, you know, it's the middle of the summer. Who's going to want to go to the Caribbean in the summer? And the answer is people with kids right. <laughs> who can take them with them. So yes, summer cruises are more expensive than uh, than a lot of winter cruises. And in fact, so the times to avoid generally, you know, the summer's a bit more expensive. Uh, obviously, Christmas is expensive and uh, spring break. Uh, and spring break is a very loose term that can go on for, you know, a month and a half. The same cabin, same itinerary, same ship, first two weeks of December for one quarter of the price that oh, you would yes. pay over the Christmas holiday. And there are many discount brokers who offer, you know, 50, 60 percent off, depending, you know, on the cruise and the time. I've used many of them and have gotten some really good deals. Well, and speaking of that, we've actually, that's my uh, raison right. d'etre. We've, uh, we've made that a lot easier. We give you a lot of tools to figure out which cruise you want to take. There's a virtual agent that will help you. There's all kinds of other information there available. We have over 500 different uh, travel agencies who are members who can see your request, and they respond with their best offer. So those discount brokers, you know, folks who really know how to work the system, who really know how to get you good deals, are all competing with each other. They all know that they're competing with each other, so they're going to come out with their best, absolute best offer right off the, the, uh, the bat. And then you can compare those. You can communicate directly with these people uh, via email or phone. Ask any questions that you like. Uh, and if you are interested, then you uh, you know you can book. But you that's really the best way to get uh, to get the best deal because you're not just going to one travel agency and seeing what they have. You've got this this pool of experts, and on their end, they can decide which ones they want to quote. If they know they've got a great deal on a certain sailing. They can search for that on that on their end. It comes up. People who want that sailing come up, and uh, and you know they can communicate with you directly through your quote. So it's, right, uh, yeah, that's a great way to to get a good deal. I know. Uh, now, when most people think of cruises, they think of big ships and mainstream cruises, which is what we're mainly talking about here. But there are many types of cruise ships available besides the mainstream, the big ones. We have the premium ones, the high end, the very high end ones. The ships are perhaps a bit smaller medium size, usually. You have the small ships, which uh, can go, they vary. I've been on, I've been on ships. I went to Baja, California. There were only 12 people on the, on the, I guess you would call it a yacht. I'm not sure what the name would be, but it was a wonderful ship. We saw a blue whale. I remember, and it was just so few of us. It was, it was meaningful. Also to the Galapagos, I took a uh, very small, it it held 20. There were only seven passengers. So that's, that's another kind of cruise. (laughs) Super duper. Wow. There are expedition ships that go to places all around the world that you can't get to otherwise and are focused on adventure. These are not mainly for families or kids. They're more for adventurers, and there are lots of those as well. There are sailing ships where they put up the sails part of the time, not usually all of the time, but I've I've taken some wonderful sailing cruises to the Mediterranean and and to Costa Rica. And then there were commercial ships. I was on a mail ship. I mentioned I almost missed the boat on on that one on the Norwegian coast, Hurtigruten, I guess you pronounce it. And also freighters. I don't know. Do you have anything to do with that on cruise computer? Nope. 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 Not in the freighter. Those are fun. Um, (laughs) The other one that uh, that you have mentioned is, is river cruising. Oh, we were going to get to that one. Very, that's become very popular. Absolutely. And basically, you have these ships that will go from anywhere from 40 to 220 passengers. Uh, they tend to mostly sail in Europe, but there are some in Africa. There are some in uh, rivers in Russia. And the real appeal of the the river ships is when they dock at the port, you're usually right downtown in the middle of things. Um, 
know, I think as we all know, cities grown up around water sources, right? And they've grown up around rivers. And so it's a great way to see Europe because you're on the ship. Again, you've you've unpacked once. You have, you know, your meals and uh, and other things all, all in one place. And then, uh, you know, you'll in the morning, you'll wake up and you're in a new port. You can walk around and, you know, see the cathedrals or tour and, you know, castles, culinary experiences, wine tasting. The, the uh, European uh, Christmas markets are also very popular in, in December. Uh, but essentially, the main thing is you're, you're right there. You know, you're right in the middle of everything. And it's a great way to see art and architecture and experience culture. Absolutely. There's less to do on board. And it's more laid back, but you get to know your fellow passengers. And as you say, you're right in the middle of the city or wherever you are. Some of my favorites around the world uh, were one I took on the Danube all the way to Bulgaria. I took one on the Yangtze River in China by the Three Gorges Dam. I was on the Amazon and to Manaus. I was Myanmar, which uh, now is uh, unfortunately having problems, but at the time was one of the most interesting places I had ever been. I took a uh, a river cruise from uh, St. Petersburg to Moscow, where you could see the steeples of the former villages sticking out from the water where Stalin had made the waterways go over the villages. It was fascinating. And the little towns were fascinating. This was in 1995 when they were coming back to life, really. And I recently took one in Ukraine on the Neva River to the Black Sea. And again, now it's very difficult. So, you know, one of the one of the things I'm thinking when I'm thinking of these cruises, I've been all over on cruises and sometimes you want to take advantage and do it because you can't do it later. And, and when I say these places, many of them right now, are uh, you're unable to get there very easily. So uh, it's a wonderful way to see the world. Mm-hmm. The name of the podcast is Places I Remember. So what are some of the memorable things you can remember about your cruises? We'll, we'll both talk about that. You know, one of the first cruises that I went on was out of Puerto Rico. In fact, it was the one that I, I had mentioned earlier. One of the memories from that one that really sticks is we went to Guadalupe, stopped at Guadalupe, and there was this hike to this waterfall. And I had act- never actually been to a, you know, again, many years ago, never really seen a real tropical waterfall before. And hiking to this thing and just the energy of standing underneath the waterfall in the, you know, in this tropical jungle pool that just, I really remember the feeling of that because, you know, you put it into words and just, well, yes, you know, it's water falling off a cliff, but it just, the emotions that it it evokes just still stick with me to this day after so much time. Yes. Sometimes a beautiful moment sticks with you for your whole life. As as you mentioned, yeah. I think cruises take take you to some of these places where you can find these moments. I wrote down a list of some of the more interesting places that I've been. I've been doing this a long time. And so many times the cruise is what I remember the most because we go to places, I, as I said before, you can't get to otherwise. I took a cruise from Santiago, Chile to Easter Island which oh, is wow. far out in the ocean in the Pacific uh, on its on the way to Bora Bora and Tahiti. That was an unusual cruise. It was a month. We went to a place called Pitcairn Island where oh, yeah. the relatives of Fletcher Christian from the Mutiny on the Bounty still live. There are only about 40 of the people. They came on board our, our cruise ship selling T-shirts and so forth. They were very excited to see the cruise ship. There isn't that much going on in the middle of the South Pacific. That was very memorable. We met most of the people from Pitcairn Island. It's an unusual not big, place. Not a big group of people. No, it's a bit, it's like a rock in the middle of the ocean, but it, it was interesting. And, and then there was a, another month long cruise I took a few years ago from Dubai to Cape Town. Fabulous itinerary where we went to the Seychelles, the Maldives, Madagascar, ended up in, in Cape Town. But the bad part was we had to go through the pirate zone for two uh-huh. weeks. Uh, half of the much of the time where we had to turn our lights off at night the ship we were on it was an oceana ship that had been uh actually uh uh, hit by pirates in 2008 so so that it wasn't something that we were just you know joking about we had we had all kinds of you know drills and so forth but we got through and it was kind of exciting i don't know i don't recommend this for everyone but the itinerary is so fabulous that you had to go through this zone to get there there was no choice. Yeah, so, wow. you know, I, I a lot of people didn't want to do it. They canceled when they mm-hmm. when they thought about it. But some people have a different risk factor than, than others. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are there are many, many wonderful places mm-hmm. in the world. 
I just think that uh, if you haven't yet cruised, you should try a short one. And, and you may be a cruise lover and, and not yet know it. And if you do love to get on a ship, hang in there. Cruising isn't going away. It remains one of the best ways to see the world. And it will adapt to our changing world. Bob Levenstein, I hope to see you on the sea. Thank you for a that really interesting great. discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for listening to our award-winning podcast. We've recorded over 100 episodes of Places I Remember, so follow us on any podcast app. And new monthly episodes are also on YouTube with gorgeous video. My book, Places I Remember, is available in print and Kindle, and I read the audio version. Follow my travel writing at Forbes.com. Contact me at the links in the show notes or on my website, placesiremembereleahlane.com, and keep making your own travel memories.